you have your Bibles, why don't you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Our series is called One. It's the book of First. We're walking through just one lesson from each chapter in the book of 1 Corinthians. We called the series One because Paul is addressing a church divided. And it's a church, Corinth is obviously a very affluent, cosmopolitan place in that first century Greek world. And they're very divided along worldly terms, kind of like the church in America today. Okay, so I think it's a timely word. And we called it one, one gospel, one church, one spirit, and one mission. And a couple weeks ago, remember, we learned God never called me to be successful. He called me to be faithful. And that if we're faithful... There's a kind of fruit that comes from that that transcends even success. Last week, we looked at chapter 5, and we learned how you see sin says everything about how you see God. How we see sin says everything about how we see God, because it starts with our vision of him, who he is, what he's called to be, what he has called us to be. And I just think that's a powerful and important part. Now, this week in chapter 6, title of today's message is let's talk about sex and as you had expected coming to church <laughs> you're like several of you just said we're staying we're staying we were gonna leave after communion but we're in <laughs> chapter six he begins by talking about lawsuits um, with your brothers and sisters he's talking about a church that is is literally when there's a dispute they're taking each other to court and he says Wait a minute, you can't settle your own disputes? You're, you're brothers and sisters. You're supposed to be like family. The Greeks were particularly litigious. They just were. It was, they had a very advanced system, their legal system, and they were far more. The Jews, not so much. The Jews understood that they were a family, and they took care of things first in, in tribes and in communities, and then if it needed to go up before the greater kind of groupings, they could. But they tried to deal with things in the context of the family. It doesn't mean they didn't have law. That doesn't mean they didn't have right and wrong. God had given them all that. But they, they had a different understanding. So Paul is kind of shocked by this group of people, they're believers, and they're, they're suing one another. And so he just says, guys, come on. You're the body of Christ. You can deal with these contexts of disputes. And here's what he says about that. I'm going to pick up at verse 7. He says, you have lawsuits. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Listen to what he says. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. He's saying, Wait, you're children of the king. You're children who, of faith. He says, rather than you hurting or doing wrong to someone else, go ahead and be wronged. Be wronged. Be defrauded. Like, I don't want to be wronged. I don't want to be defrauded. He says, well, you're a child of the king. He says, you're cared for. God will meet your needs. If you lose something, you know your father has the capacity to take care of you. You're fine. It's, it's better to be wronged, he says, than to wrong someone. And that's the framework. And that's a faith perspective. We understand that. We understand that he's talking about faith. And he goes on and he says, this is verse 9. He turns here and changes the subject. He says, or don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is this idea of God's, God's design for all of us, for every person on the planet. He wants them to be under his rule and his reign for the purpose of the blessing and the, the gifts that he wants to give. But it is his kingship. Make no mistake. Don't you, unno, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. He goes on, neither the sexually immoral, in the Greek that word is pornos, and it's often translated fornicators. That's people who are sexually involved outside of God's design. And that word pornos, interestingly, they would talk about male prostitutes in that culture. They would use that phrase, but that's not all it meant. It particularly meant just sexual immorality outside of God's design. He says, so neither the sexually immoral nor the idolaters nor adulterers, those who violate their marriage vows, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, not drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So he lists this list of people who can't inherit the kingdom of God, and then he says this in verse 11, and such were some of you. In other words, lest you're getting all self-righteous right now and pointing fingers, he goes, wait a minute, where do you think you came from? Remember, the Bible says all have sinned. He says, such were some of you. And then he says this, but you were washed. 
You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. In other words, you were forgiven and you were filled. You were forgiven because of the cross of Jesus where he paid the penalty for your sins. And then you were filled with his Spirit. And he goes on to this, says this, verse 12. And understand he's quoting here. He's quoting a saying that they would have said. All things are lawful for me. And then he comments, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Here's another saying. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. The Greeks had this idea. They didn't love the, they, they just thought that the metaphysical was far more significant than the physical world. They didn't have, you know, if you've studied Gnosticism, you, you understand that this idea that they just kind of didn't give much credence. It didn't matter. It was all perishing. And it also meant, well, then I can do whatever I want with my body because it's base and it's not eternal. It doesn't matter anyway. And so he says, Food is meant for the stomach, stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. In other words, they are going to perish one day. And he goes on and says this, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And listen, God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. In other words, your body, there will be a new body, a resurrected body. So don't look down on your bodies, because look what else he says. Do you not know, this is verse 15, that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? He's bringing up an interesting timeless principle. For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. He's quoting from Genesis 2. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And then going into chapter 7, look what he says. He's now concerning the matters about which you wrote. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. He's talking about unmarried people. And then verse 2, he says, But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you for your word, and I pray that you would help us to hear your word. Help us to hear the truth of your word, and help us to hear the love of your words, the love in your words. And help us to respond with humility and obedience as we listen for your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So verse 9 is his key. That's kind of his transition, right? Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? There is this sense of saying, you know, we cannot just kind of do whatever we want and say, God, I want everything that you have. And again, remember, he said, lest you be self-righteous, such were some of you. Such were some of you. The big question that this brings up is how do I see redemption? How do I see the redemption that is ours through Jesus Christ and his cross? Is redemp- does redemption mean I can do whatever I want because of grace? Because of Jesus, because of grace, I can just do whatever I want. I've kind of got an eternal hall pass. I said the prayer, I've gone to church a couple times, so now I can do whatever I want. Or does God have something bigger and am I being formed in the image of Christ? How do I view my salvation? How do I view redemption? What is it that I'm actually seeing? And it's then that Paul goes into this conversation about sexual purity, and I want us to have that conversation, this idea of sexual purity. Now, we live in a culture with all kinds of different views on sexuality. And the question is, how did we get here? Something happened in the 1960s, and it didn't start there, obviously, right? This is a part of who we are as people. But in the 1960s in the United States, we saw what was called the sexual revolution. And it was really a revolution against what at the time was the Judeo-Christian norms of the 1940s, 1950s, and really before in America. America's a very unique place, right? It really is. We need to understand this. We are a country that was founded from the very beginning with this Judeo-Christian ethic. I am not saying that all the founders were spirit-filled disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. What I am saying is they had a biblical worldview, 
Many of them came here for religious freedom. Others came for other reasons. But from the very beginning in our founding documents, there's this idea of God. There's this idea of his work, and you see his law in our, you see it in the Declaration of Independence. You see images of it. You see things in the Constitution that suggest and whisper to this idea. You see many of the founders were religious founders. And so while not everybody was a Christian, there was this sense of, okay, right and wrong is basically what biblical Christianity is. And that's very unusual in world history and church history. And so all throughout the early decades, the early years of this nation, that was kind of just the norm. Even if people weren't, certain people weren't walking by that, they understood, yeah, there's the Ten Commandments, there's the Beatitudes, there's turn the other cheek, there's go the extra mile. All these sayings that we have are because of our Judeo-Christian roots. And it was the, kind of the morality of the day. Well, in the 60s, something began to happen, and there was this revolution. And it was a revolution against that Judeo-Christian norm. And what happened was there was a growing acceptance of things that were not really accepted before. That doesn't mean they weren't done before. But they weren't accepted in the same way. And that's a difference. Growing acceptance of premarital sex. Whereas it happened before, but there was this sense of taboo. And in the 60s, it kind of came out and said, no, no, why should this be taboo? Homosexual sex, same thing. Adultery even. While adultery was never, adultery was never kind of uh, advocated. And it wasn't like they gave people a pass. It just wasn't as shocking as it was before. How about divorce? It had happened before, but there was this kind of resolve and this acceptance of it. Pornography. Interestingly, the pill, as an affordable and generally effective birth control method, facilitated kind of the separation of one of the natural consequences of sex outside of marriage. And it kind of created an opportunity where, okay, that's one consequence that I probably won't have to deal with. Then in 1969, a lady named Norma McCorby became pregnant here, actually, in Texas. You might know her by a pseudonym she used for the trial. Her, her pseudonym was Jane Roe. And she sued for the right to have an abortion. And in 1973, Roe v. Wade was passed as the law of the land by the Supreme Court. And now it wasn't just possible to prevent pregnancy, but to terminate pregnancy. And that changed the playing field. And that was largely based on this sexual revolution. Because you're like, well, I know a surefire way to prevent pregnancy. That's do not have sex. Okay, there's a surefire way. But because that, by 1969, 1970, 1971, 72, 73, that was unacceptable. You, that's, you just can't even consider that. Now we have to deal with this consequence called pregnancy. And so abortion became the law of the land. So that's just kind of a, a walk at, at where this radical shift in American thinking came. Slogans began to emerge. Well, if it feels good, do it. You love who you love. It's just sex. New concepts. Sexual identity. Gender identity. As opposed to God's design. You need to understand, those are recent concepts. Okay? This idea that aside from the way we are created and designed, there are these other concepts, these idea of alternate identities emerged. And all of this, this, this sexual battle, became the front line for a humanist rebellion against the theistic worldview. And this wasn't new. You need to understand, for us in America, it felt new. It wasn't new. This had been going on all over the world for thousands of years. In Romans chapter 1, Paul is writing, and he talks about how people rejected God, how they rejected him and his leadership and some of the consequences of that. And in verse 24 of Romans 1, here's what he says, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. 
And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. It's not just sexual. He's saying all these things, you reject God, you rebel against God, this is what happens. Deceit, maliciousness. Or excuse me, they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of the evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them but give approval to those who practice them. And then the rest of the book of Romans, he goes on and gives God's plan of redemption through Jesus Christ. He describes the salvation that God has in the midst of this rebellion. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down because here's the main point of the whole thing I think Paul is wanting to say and I want us to kind of center on. God wants to redeem and bless every area of life, including your sex life. God wants to redeem and bless every area of your life, including your sex life. And I just want you to know, folks, we got to talk about this. We have to talk about this. It is everywhere. It is as though in our culture there is, the, there is the sacrament of sexuality. And everything centers around it. We can't ignore this. Now I want to give you this morning four principles of sexual purity, if I can. Four principles of sexual purity that Paul brings from this passage of Scripture and that I think we can draw. First, and this is so important, so basic, but you got to grab it. First, you have a creator, and we're created with a design. Let me say that again. You have a creator, and we're created with a design. This is a core idea. This is discipleship 101. You were created, and you were bought with a price. That's what verses 19 and 20 said. It says you're bought with a price. You're not your own. We have a creator, and we were created with a design, and this is a core idea. We are not our own. We're followers of Jesus. This is just basic Christianity. He created us, and then when we sold ourselves into the slavery of sin, he bought us back. And that's an understanding. So what that means is sex is something you do, not something you are. Some of you need to write that one down. Sex is something you do, not something you are, because we've, been, we've t- turned sex into something that we are. See, sex is not your identity. Your sexual attractions do not get to determine your identity. Your identity is who God created you to be and who you are in Christ. That's for every one of us. The designer, the creator, gets to tell what our identity is. And this idea that our attractions get to create our identity is an absolute broken and bankrupt idea that we need to stop and look at it critically critically and go, wait a minute, why do we believe that? The attraction is different than identity. We all have unhealthy attractions. The scripture says all have sinned. You understand that, right? We all have unhealthy attractions. We talk about the person with same-sex attractions, and we get all worked up about that. And that is, according to scripture, an unhealthy, unbiblical attraction. But it's not different than the married man who's made a vow to his wife, and he has an attraction to a woman who's not his wife. And he's going, I'd like to be with her. Do you understand that that doesn't make him an adulterer? The attraction does not make him an adulterer. What makes him an an adulterer is following that attraction and acting on it. Then he becomes an adulterer. If a person has same-sex attraction, that doesn't make them homosexual. Homosexuality is an act. In the same way that a person... A, a, a man who sees a woman he's not married to, hey, I'm attracted to her, he, he's not an adulterer yet. Temptation is not a sin. Temptation is something that we have to overcome. Temptation is something we all face, we all walk through. But it's not my identity. And we really got to grab onto this. That is not our identity. We are all in the process of becoming more like Jesus. And this is so important. And we've talked about different kind of attractions. Not even forget sexual. I told you before, there are some people who might just be more volatile. 
okay? Blame it on your nationality. I am Irish, so I have a temper, all right? Say whatever you want. And, and you know, I'm not, I don't know, maybe there is some genetic predisposition for some people to be more volatile. Maybe on, one, on the plus side, it's more passionate and more decisive. Maybe on the negative side, it's a little more volatile. You might say, gee, I'm sorry, I got a gene. I can't help it. I get mad, and so therefore I can't help myself. You can't get mad at me when I punch people in the face. I just have this desire and I punch people in the face. No, we would never, we would go, no, 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 no. You may have this volatility, but you can choose not to punch people in the face. And we encourage you to stop punching people in the face because they're going to punch back. And, and I'm just saying, it's, a, it's an attraction. It's a, it's a tendency. It's a thing. And see, one of the things that we understand here, and this is what's interesting, and, and to those who, who have struggled with or do struggle with same-sex attraction, I just want to say to you, one of the great tragedies and harms that culture, the church has played a part in this too, the culture's played a part in this, we've all played a part in this, you have been made to feel like you're different. Like you're, you're different. You have this, this, nobody else understands this, you're different. You're not different. We all have that. It might not be same-sex attraction, but it might be attraction to lots of people of the opposite sex that, that, that we could say, well, I have an attraction, and so I can go and I can just have sex with whomever I want. And we say, no, 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 you can't. The Bible teaches us that we can say no to harmful attractions. It might be anger. It might be, I'm a klepto. I can't help it. I've stolen three things this morning while you weren't looking. I'm sorry. I hate to tell you that. No, I'm kidding. But the point is, you know what I'm saying? It's like we all have it. So if you're here with same-sex attraction and, and you kind of wrestle with that, hid that, or, or maybe tried to identify yourself with that, I just want to say, we're not different. We're the same. And while I maybe can't understand your particular unhealthy attraction or unbiblical attraction, I got a whole bunch of my own I'm wrestling with. And how we deal with this. Now, see, this is where it matters. Because... We're all called to be here. We're all called to follow Jesus. And that's what we do. We're called to help each other follow Jesus. See, our goal is to conform our lives to his word and his design, not try to get him to conform to ours. You know, if someone comes to be a part of the fellowship, it's like, don't change me. Don't, change, don't try to change me. It misses the whole point. We are all growing and changing to become more like Jesus, every one of us, starting with the guy behind the lectern on the platform. We are becoming more like Christ. That's called Christian maturity. We are overcoming the things because we have the power of his spirit. We've been forgiven by the cross. We, 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 are, we are being filled with his spirit, empowered to change. You see, come into the church and say, yeah, I want to be part of the church. You know, I want to check the church box, and I, I want to, you know, say I go to church and stuff, but don't try to change me. That's like going to the gym. Don't try to get me in shape. And don't make me feel bad about my slab. And the trainer's looking at me like, there's definitely things around here that are going to make you feel bad about your flab. But we can help with that. No, 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 no. I didn't come here to get in shape or whatever you call it. I just want to have a gym membership. All my friends have gym memberships. And I just want to be one of the guys. And they're like, that's ridiculous. They say, well, what we do is like going to the doctor. Whoa, doctor, whoa, 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 don't be, don't be dealing with this sickness of mine. Doctor's like, there's some things I'm going to do that might make you feel a little bad about some of that, but good news is I'm helping you get over it. I'm helping you grow. I'm helping you get past that, you know? That, those blood tests where we're going to deal with the cholesterol, we're going to deal with the, the high blood pressure, we're going to deal with all those things. But good news, I can help you some diet, some exercise, maybe some medication. I can help you not have to live that way. Good news. Whoa, doc, I didn't want to, I didn't want to change. I just wanted my yearly physical. Don't, don't, don't be talking to me about my health. That's what happens when people come into the church and go, well, yeah, I want to be part of the church, but don't try to have, don't say I need to change. Here's the deal. It doesn't work that way because we're all conforming to the image of Jesus. We are all growing to become more like Christ. That's what discipleship is. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I'm not leading Jesus, and he's following me around. <laughs> it is funny to think of it. That was a great giggle, by the way. That was a classic, wonderful. <laughs> no, but I'm, uh, you know what I'm saying? And that's the problem. It, we, we, 
We all are here to grow, to become more of who Jesus created us to be. That's our assignment. God wants to redeem and bless every area of your life, including your sex life. That's what Paul, I think, is telling us. Second principle. God's design for sex is that it be enjoyed only between a man and wife in a committed marriage relationship. And the Bible does not stutter on that. God's design for sex is that it be enjoyed only between a man and wife in a committed marriage relationship. Stop and think of how much, brain, uh, how much uh, pain and brokenness sexual sin has brought into our lives and lives of family and friends and people we know and into our culture. Think of all the children from broken homes that, bottom line, it was sexual sin that led to the brokenness in that home. See, that's not a game. That's not, oh, that's just sex. No, no, when I, when I see kids who just lost their family, their whole world jerked out from under them. And now they're doing the back and forth, the two different families and the maybe three and all the stuff that that drags those kids from. And it's related to a sexual sin. It's like, it's not just sex. Broken homes, families torn apart. The millions of children who've been lost to abortion and the millions of moms who have had to go through this painful experience. Heartache. Betrayal. Venereal disease, including 33 million deaths due to AIDS, HIV, according to the World Health Organization. The vast majority of which are sexually transmitted. See, that is not God's design. That is not what God has for us. God's design is that we wait for marriage to have sex and that it, it be an expression between a husband and a wife. Remember chapter 7, 1 Corinthians 7, 1 and 2, we read it. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Genesis 2, 24 and 25. And understand, the verse we're about to look at, it's foundational. You need to know this. We, every, every single wedding I do, I quote this verse. When Jesus talked about sexuality and divorce, and he quoted this verse. When the Apostle Paul, multiple times, he talked about it here in 1 Corinthians 6, he quoted that verse, a phrase from that verse. But in Ephesians chapter 5, when he talks significantly, he talks about this verse. He quotes this. Every time you hear marriage talked about, this verse is quoted. Genesis 2, 24 and 25. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And that's the key idea. Something about sexual relationship makes one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. That's in the Genesis reference. Hebrews 13, 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. That's sexually immoral. That's that word, porneo, or pornos. See, God's design is that we wait for marriage to have sex, that sex be that expression, that, that beautiful intimacy between a husband and a wife. Do you know what's interesting? It was never part of the design that we would bring comparisons into the bedroom of our marriage. This act was designed to only be between a man and a wife and as a unique expression that only they would share. There's never supposed to be comparisons. Never supposed to be this idea, wow, I wish you were more like this one, or, oh, this, there's, this idea of dissatisfaction, it's just, it would be the only, the design is that this was designed to be between a man and a wife and this expression with one another. And that there's not supposed to be these comparisons and these things. And there's some people out there who literally will say, I mean, there's literally this idea, well, you can't marry someone if you haven't slept together because, you know, what if they're no good? Yeah, you laugh, act, act offended. You've all heard someone say that kind of stuff. You want to hit them in the head. Because it's like, what? Is this a, a sport? You're going to pull out a scorecard? You know? I mean, really, we act like it's a, some sort of performance. And this, this, idea, this, this, this idea of all focus on me and how good are you at pleasing me. Instead of this idea of, we're going to share something uniquely with each other that we're not sharing with anybody. We never have shared with anybody else. We're never going to share with anybody else. 
I mean, I understand things happen and things change, but th this is the design. We're not supposed to bring comparisons and all these different, all this baggage into our marriage. God's design is that in the context of the children born as a result of sexual involvement or procreation, that they have both parents with them to love and to raise them. That's what his design is for. That's where it's supposed to happen. And some of you right now are going, John, dude, you are being so hard because there are so many people who've experienced brokenness and pain and so many people who've experienced less than the idea. How, this is almost cruel you're being so hard. Stop it, okay? Seriously, it is not being cruel because uh, let me tell you what, I'm from a broken family that experienced brokenness. My dad had affairs on my mom. My family was broken. And so I'm not sitting here going, you know, oh, but it hurts to talk about the ideal. No, let me tell you something. That pain, that hurt from that, you know what that made me do? I want the ideal. I saw the other side firsthand. I didn't need to read a book. I walked through that pain. And it made me say, okay, you know what? Not in my house. Not for my kids. I don't want them ever to have to experience that. See, just because most of us in some capacity, whether it's us or someone we love or care about, have experienced or been a party to or had to grieve with someone who's had less than the ideal, that should not lower our commitment to God's ideal. That pain should actually cause us to go, yep, we should be the biggest cheerleaders. Those of us who've been hurt by the pain of brokenness of sexual sin and the, the devastation that comes from it, we should be the biggest advocates and cheerleaders. Because I don't want that. I don't want that for my kids. I don't want that for anybody. God wants to redeem and bless every area of your life, including your sex life. And his design for sex is that be enjoyed, it be enjoyed only between a man and wife in a committed marriage relationship. Number three, and this is really interesting. I want you to hear this. All sin has the same penalty, but not the same consequence. Isn't that interesting? Did you catch that one part? There's that part of, of 1 Corinthians 6 that we read that's kind of unusual. Talking about all other sins a person commits are outside the body. That's verse 18. Let me actually read it for you. Verse 18 said, Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. What does he mean by that? I don't think he's saying that the penalty is different. Because all sin has the same penalty, just not the same consequences. Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death, right? But he's talking about this idea that there's something that happens. Sexual sin is a sin against your body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we carry that, the consequences, in our body. And it's because of this, this ancient concept from Genesis 2, of one flesh. There is a bonding and a connection that happens when we, remember he talked about if a man joins himself to a prostitute? It's like, because you're becoming one flesh, yet your spirit, you're one spirit with God. It says something's wrong. And this one flesh idea, this isn't just creative poetic language. There is something that happens. God gave in sexuality, and for a husband and wife, there is something of a bonding that happens in that, in that act that's very powerful and significant. Let me tell you something. I was a youth pastor. My first ministry was a youth pastor in Southern California, and I learned real quickly. I could spot the difference in these high school couples, high school, early college couples who had been sexually active and sleeping together versus those who had. And, and the primary way I could tell is when they broke up. When they broke up, a high school couple breaking up because... Most, if they weren't, if they had not been sexually active, they had not become one flesh, they have the breakup, there might be tears, there might be other things, but it wasn't as violent. I watched teens break up, and it was like this horrible divorce, this tearing, this ripping apart. And I knew, and I would, I would meet with them, and I would talk with them, and I would dial down, and every single time, have you been sexually active? Yes, yes we have. And it's because they were one flesh. See, that principle, God placed it in us. 
And this now, when they broke up, it wasn't just two kids deciding not to continue dating. It was the tearing of one flesh. And it was hurtful. It was painful. God designed us not to experience that. See, all sin has the same penalty, but not the same consequence, because this is a sin against your own flesh, and there are physical consequences. We talk about pregnancy. We talk about children. It's a physical consequence. Disease, sexual addiction, stuff that you carry with you, stuff that you carry into a marriage one day. That's what Paul's trying to let us know. This is serious. Take it seriously. God wants to redeem and bless every area of your life, including your sex life. And last thing, and this is some of you right now, maybe you're feeling a little beat up. Some of you are feeling maybe a little hopeless. And here's the good news. Number four, God has empowered you to live in sexual purity. He is not asking you to do this on your own. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20. Let's read it again. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Look at verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. See the important statement there? You have the Holy Spirit in you as a follower of Jesus. He didn't just say, hey, guys, um, I'm going to put this thing in you. I'm going to put this temptation in you. You better not use it or I'm going to thump you. Okay? No. He said, I've got, got a gift and a promise waiting here, and I want you to have it. And I'm going to fill you with my spirit and empower you to walk in sexual purity. I'm going to give you the gift of my spirit. So sometimes, and, and you're like, but how do I do that? Literally, you're tempted you're in that moment of temptation, and you stop and say, oh, God, give me your strength. Help me to say no. Help me to walk away. Help me not to fall into sin. Whatever that sin may look like. And his spirit is in you. And I promise you that you, you take that moment and ask for his strength. You take that step, just one small step, of obedience and he will empower you to go the rest of the way he's not just telling you hey figure it out he says I'm with you and I want to empower you to live a different kind of life if you're here and maybe you're like well I wish I would have heard this 10 years ago 20 years ago a little late right now let me just say to you you, you can't undo the past right you can't go back and, and do it differently. But let me tell you this truth, and I want you to hear this. But God can forgive the past. And listen, not just forgive it, he can redeem the past. He can take that past and make it something redemptive to where all of a sudden you become a person who is able to teach and advocate and able to, to cheerlead for sexual purity in a way that maybe is different. If you have failed or fallen when it comes to this issue, I just want to say, this is not an unforgivable sin. There is forgiveness in the cross of Jesus Christ. You, as a follower of Jesus, when you are forgiven of your sins and you accept him as Lord and Savior, you are filled with his spirit and you are empowered to live the life that he's called you to. In your family, in your job, in every area, including this one. The question is, will you let him, let him do it? Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you for your word. Lord, this message is so counterculture. Lord, I just think as, as the years go by, Lord, we're going to see more out of sorts with our culture. People are going to look at us the way maybe we looked at the Amish, as those people with those odd beliefs and those odd behaviors, Lord. And that's the way they've looked at your church throughout history. Help us not to shy away from that. Help us to follow you. And help us to trust you enough to bring good fruit as we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. I asked the band to just redo that song we had done earlier, I've Decided to Follow Jesus. I want us to sing that with this in mind. I've decided to follow Jesus. 
I'm going to do this. Lord, I have decided I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be your disciple. And in this area of my sexuality, I'm going to surrender it to your leadership. Because, man, that's what being a follower of Jesus means. Can we stand together? Let's commit this to him together as a congregation. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. I was made for to live what the word says in regarding in regards to sexual purity as a congregation I want us to live that I want us to teach it I want to teach it to our children I want to teach it to our kids I want to teach it to young people around us I want to make that something that we are unashamedly about about and I don't care I don't care how old-fashioned that makes us seem. I don't care. But see, this isn't about being current, hip, or whatever. It's about being faithful to the Word of God. And the third thing is I want us to be advocates, not just teaching, but advocating and helping other people understand because this is a big deal, and it is the sacrament of our secular culture, sexual freedom. And real sexual freedom can only be found when we carry it out in accordance with the design of the designer, the way our Creator intended it. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you created us for life. Help us to trust you enough to walk in it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.